Good morning. I'm Congresswoman Jackie Spear as co-chair of the UXO the Mining Caucus and the Democratic Women's Caucus. I'm pleased to highlight the experiences of women in demining roles and hear from our distinguished panelists. I'm joined this morning by my co-chair, uh, Congressman uh, Johnson, and um, look forward to his remarks as well. Um, let me just start off by saying that with the women joining us today on the panel and their colleagues in the field are nothing short of sheroes. So demining is difficult work. It's also very dangerous work that requires technical expertise, pain take, painstaking care, patience, and extensive training, all while wearing heavy protective gear, or as I like to say, a perfect job for a woman. Today, thousands of women are serving their communities by removing landmines and bombs from across the globe. And I'm inspired by the barrier breaking women excelling in this traditionally male dominated role. Employing women in this field um, reduces income inequality and supports economic development overall. In addition to increasing productivity in local markets, studies show that working women reinvest 90% of their income back into their families compared with only 35% for men, allowing communities and nations across the world to thrive. So another way of saying this is when you hire a woman, it's a bigger economic boost in a community. I had the opportunity to meet with some of, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these incredible women <clears throat> when I traveled to Nagorno Karabakh in 2019. And here's a picture of me standing with one of our great deminers in um, the Artsakh region. It's the world's highest per capita mine accident rate and unfortunately has been unimaginable in the violence um, that has happened since then. The demining team, some of them all women, have done incredible brave and vital work. In particular, I had the privilege and honor of meeting with Guy and Malonian, who I just showed you the picture of, one of the Halo Trust permanent deminers to hear about the life-saving work she does on a daily basis. Although public funds ran out from this program last year, I was proud to secure, <clears throat> excuse me, report language in the FY21 House passed appropriations bill to support the work of Guyon and others in the region as they move forward. Women deminers also challenge traditional gender roles and help reshape societal views towards women's work especially in areas where there are few opportunities for women. Increasingly, women are the world's most successful peacemakers. We know that, for example, peace agreements are 35% more likely to last when women are included at the negotiating table. The demining sector is just one more crucial area in which the inclusion of women is bringing greater peace, security, and prosperity to the world. We also know that mines and other explosive remnants of war uniquely impact women and children. These hazards often block safe access to schools, uh, play areas, healthcare facilities, and even sources of water. They prevent women and families from farming their land or engaging in economic activities. We must ensure that we're doing everything we can to eliminate these threats to benefit women and children and enable, enable the safety and prosperity of entire nations. I'm proud to be leading a letter to the Appropriations Committee this year in support of millions of dollars in increased funding to the Conventional Weapons Destruction Program. And I'm grateful, truly grateful, that my co-chair, Representative Bill Johnson, for his leadership on these issues and for joining us today. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to my uh, co-chair, a great reminder that Democrats and Republicans can and do work well together. Congressman? Yes, we do, Jackie. Thank you so very much. And, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us today. I'm, uh, I'm Bill Johnson, as, uh, as Representative Spear told you. I represent Ohio's 6th Congressional District, uh, and I'm very proud to be uh, her co-chair of the UXO Demining Caucus, again, this Congress. Um, as you may know, uh, today's briefing focuses on women in demining, uh, and that's an appropriate tribute, uh, belated tribute to International Women's Day, which was celebrated last week on March 8th, 
And also, uh, because we're here in uh, Women's History Month, you know, I have a wife, two daughters, four granddaughters, two sisters, and countless nieces. So I'm surrounded by strong women, and they are all very hardworking women. So I believe the achievements of women should be celebrated every day. And, and while International Women's Day and Women's History Month celebrate the cultural, societal, and economical contributions of women, uh, we're about to hear today that women have an immense, have had an immense impact on the demining sector. The women on this panel and who uh, those who remove landmines are nothing short of heroes. Uh, 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 Jackie mentioned that. Demining is difficult work. She, uh, Representative Spear got the one ups on me. Uh, she showed a picture. I, I've actually got some pictures, but I, I, can't, I can't look through my phone right now and get them and, and, and still talk to you folks. But, but it's difficult work for anyone involving hour after hour of tedious manual labor, sometimes in difficult terrain and always while wearing heavy protective gear. Uh, and it's dangerous work that requires incredible painstaking care. I had a chance to see this work firsthand when I visited one of Halo Trust's demining sites in the Northeast province of Sri Lanka in 2017. What a humbling experience that was. And, and most of the work there is being done by women, war widows from Sri Lanka's decades long civil war. Though the conflict ended in 2009, efforts to clear the extensive amounts of landmines and unexploded ordinances continues even to today. So that displaced women and families can return to their land. And if they don't do it, it doesn't get done. Uh, they want to live and to cultivate their land in order to make a livelihood. In fact, Halo Trust has assisted in the clearing of over 300,000 mines and unexploded ordinances in Sri Lanka. I'm very supportive of the work they're doing and for the funding that the State Department contributes toward these efforts. As I mentioned, Sri Lanka's civil war resulted in far too many war widows with families to support. This is devastating. That, those are some of the pictures that I, that I wish I had brought, uh, brought up today. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka also has one of the world's lowest levels of women's labor force participation rates. As in that country, women face a variety of obstacles from discrimination to mismatched skills to lack of opportunities. While it's unfortunate that demining continues to be a necessary sector of employment there, it has enabled many of these women the means to provide for themselves and their families while conducting work in which they take enormous pride. Beyond employment, landmines and other explosive remnants of war uniquely impact women in Sri Lanka and in places all around the world. These hazards often block safe access to schools and healthcare facilities and even sources of water. When we remove these threats, women and girls can access key services. They can gain an education, receive medical care for themselves and their children, and importantly, gain access to clean drinking water. In the United States, we often take these things for granted. One reason I'm proud to co-chair this caucus is to help ensure that we're doing everything we can, not only to educate about the demining activities, but to eliminate these threats to benefit women and enable the safety and prosperity of entire nations. So I look forward to hearing more from our esteemed panelists today. I'm really glad to be with you. And let me, uh, let me turn it back over now. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Bill, very much. Um, we do have a, a wonderful panel and I'd like to introduce them to you now. Um, Emma Atkinson is a branch chief at the Bureau of Political Military Affairs Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement at the Department of State. She manages a team of people responsible for implementing the US conventional weapons destruction in East Asia and the Pacific, South and Central Asia and Western Hemisphere Affairs. Her team manages over $100 million in foreign assistance funds annually that assist countries with the remediation of unexploded ordinances, as well as physical security and stockpile management of small arms and light weapons. 
Ms. Atkinson previously worked on these issues in East Asia and the Pacific. She's joined the civil service in July of 2011, but has been involved in the humanitarian mine action sector since 2009. Following her is Megan Dwyer, the deputy program manager for Halo Angola. She previously served as the program officer for the Somalia program, where she worked with the data teams and the mine risk education teams. Prior to Halo, Megan worked at, in monitoring and evaluation of humanitarian projects in East Africa and mental health research with the Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense. Delia Mafosa is the community liaison team leader with MAG Zimbabwe. She has over 10 years experience in the humanitarian sector, including in health, water and sanitation and sexual and gender-based violence. Before working with MAG, Delia partnered and worked with Family Impact, Organization of Rural Associations for Progress and spearheaded projects supported by USAID, UNICEF, DFID and AUSAID. She is passionate about advocating for human rights and protections as we all are. So with that, um, we enjoy now the opportunity to hear from our guest speakers. Hi, I believe I am first up. Um, so, <laughs> Welcome, Megan. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, first I'd like to thank uh, Representative Spear and Johnson for your time today. Um, this is such an important topic within the mine action sector. And I'm grateful to be able to participate uh, in this panel and with the, the wider discussion. Uh, a little bit about myself. My role in the Halo Angola team has changed considerably over the last two and a half years. Um, as mentioned, I started out as the program officer and then moved on to the finance uh, and contracts manager before finally becoming uh, the deputy program manager, which as of last week, I have just handed over um, and have become the program manager of the Kosovo program uh, where I am today. Um, a typical day for me is always a really difficult question um, that people, when they ask, I struggle to answer because uh, no two days are ever the same. Um, I would say normally a day involves ensuring that the teams in the field have all of the tools and the equipment that they require uh, to do their job safely, um, as always our, our first concern, but also to the most effective um, effectiveness of, the, of their abilities. Um, I also would monitor the program's uh, progress as compared to our, our donor outputs, uh, as, long, as well as the budgets, which are always very important. Um, I would also liaise a lot with the stakeholders, uh, both in country and out of country. I and mean, this last one was really particularly important uh, when it came to Halo Angola's 100 Women in Demining project. Um, the idea behind the project, of course, being to empower women both economically by supplying livelihoods, um, but also culturally uh, by showing that women can thrive in a sector that has traditionally been male dominated. Um, so reaching out to donors and trying to generate support for this project in the beginning took quite a bit of time. It was a bit slow going. Um, however, I am quite excited to say that following our last recruitment in January of this year uh, and completion of training in February of this year, the 100 Women in Demining project has hit and actually exceeded our target um, with 120 women in operational positions, um, which is you know, very, very exciting. Uh, the Angolan team is now going to be looking to set a new target. Um, we don't want to just stop at 100 women or 120 women. Um, I think we are going to look for look to achieve 50% women across the program, um, and this will include support roles such as logisticians, drivers, uh, administrative officers, hopefully even some mechanics if we can. Um, and the reason this is a pretty lofty goal for the program is that we're already quite a large team, uh, and we will be expanding. Um, significantly over the next eight to 10 months, uh, thanks to very generous um, efforts um, and US legislation, particularly focusing on conservation efforts in the Akabanga region. So this expansion, the Halo, and uh, Halo Angola program, um, comes with a whole new set of challenges. 
uh, most of them stemming from the location where we work. Currently, uh, most of the 100 women in demining uh, teams that we recruited, we were able to recruit from the communities directly uh, that we would be working in, um, giving us the opportunity to keep uh, family, you know, keep the women closer to their families and to their homes, um, much shorter time, traveling time uh, when they are on their breaks de between deployment cycles. Uh, so one of the bigger challenges we're going to face with this new project is because it is working in the Akavanga, uh, the parks region, so it's going to be significantly more remote uh, and will require a lot more in the logistics planning uh, to make sure that, you know, people, the, all of the teams, men and women, do get enough opportunity to get home from their families or to their families um, and make sure that, you know, we're giving them the best quality of life that we can whilst they are working in the camps. Uh, the terrains are going to be working on are, are very difficult. Um, they're very, very densely laid minefields. Um, and it's extremely hot, uh, very arid. And when it's not hot and arid, it's raining. So there's there's quite a lot uh, for us to, to consider on how we are going to deploy these women uh, to be the best that they can be. Um, as a final note, I just wanted to mention that I am unbelievably privileged to become the program manager of the Kosovo program because the Kosovo program was the first program in Halo to recruit uh, women D minors. So this is certainly a legacy that I am um, looking, uh, looking very forward to continuing uh, the legacy. So thank you again for your time um, and for the ability to, to participate on this. Um, and I believe now Halo will try uh, and play a short video um, from clips from women in the field. Before I join Hello, I didn't know that I am this strong, I am this um, courageous, this brave. Before I joined Hello, I was just a normal, or a normal lady who just um, study, work. But when I joined Hello, um, my life is a little bit different. I learned how to live far away from family, learn how to travel from two different areas, learn how to work and learn how to accommodate myself. Another pair, Indra Kumar Raja, Tilly Nayahi. Uda pair, Ila, Nanga Pui Muam Lirende, Tirima Mulkudiamanda Mutam, Angalagasiana custom. In the Tatanjan Sunam, well, demining at Tanam village in demining lay, I will select Paniat, Medic Gupona, Medic Gagi, Vandur, Mundamarthalina, and a Sia and Bay, and Adon Frasana Shakadan, Alhamdulillah. And I got a Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, after watching that video, it's 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 very empowering, and I'm glad to be, be to be part of that movement that um, Spearheads 
um, clearance in our areas. And I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to be also part of this forum and to have a chance to share a bit about women in demining. So my name is Dilia Maposa. I'm the community liaison manager in the Mag Zimbabwe program. My role basically is community orientated. Um, I focus mostly on overseeing operations in line with community mobilization and coordination. Um, I oversee facilitating of mine risk edu education sessions and conducting non-technical surveys and um, explosive ordinance rapid response. Um, I'm also in charge of stakeholder and community engagement and dialogue. So I interface a lot with the community and various stakeholders. So because of my role, I know that women are particularly affected by landmines um, in our cultural setup because they are the farmers, they are the food gatherers, and they are the ones that fetch water and firewood for use in the homestead. Um, landmines in Zimbabwe and also in many other countries inhibit access to productive farmland, water sources, and other critical natural resources that are necessary for day-to-day -day survival, including in rural Mutsi where I work. Um, when injured by landmines or yuxos, women and girls who are victims have faced um, great stigmatization. They are not only perceived as non-productive members of the community, but they, are, they become a burden to their families and community at large. I have encountered um, about eight mine accident victims in Muzi who were abandoned by their husbands because of their injuries. They also not only had to cope with the trauma of the accident, but they also had to try and figure out how they are going to support and fend for their families. Those women suffered terrible psychological consequences associated with the presence of, of landmines and landmine related injuries in their communities. Because it's a, since it's a general norm in our culture that um, women in our community are expected to take up the role of nursing to help an injured or maimed family member and be the primary caregiver. While on the other hand, they'll also be expected to take up the role and responsibility of supporting the families economically. So as I earlier indicated that um, women are constantly exposed to the dangers of landmine while doing basic household chores and constantly worrying about their children's safety and that of the greater family in general. It is therefore prudent, I believe, that it's good to involve them in their own liberation or emancipation and offer them a chance to play their part in ridding their communities of landmines and take and take strides towards reclaiming their land. So as MAG, the employment of female demanders in our area of operation has been very transformative. I've been one of the ladies, <laughs> being one of the ladies in the, who have benefited from it because it has contributed immensely to our economic empowerment, ultimately increasing our participation in, and decision-making power in our communities and in our households. It has increased our sphere of influence in our communities and has really empowered us to actually take a, take a stand and speak up in some situations. Um, it, ultimately, the, 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 the upside of it all is that we can now support our families and, and, and it's all because of these jobs that come from my action. Um, for example, we have one female deminer in our program who was abandoned by her husband and left to fend and support for five children on her own. She struggled to even put food on the table, let alone send her children to school. But, and she was surviving mostly on relief food aid come and some handouts from the community. But since she started working for MAG, she's now able to support her family, send her children to school. And I'm glad to say now she's even building a, a brick house for her family. So that's, 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 how, that's the impact that awarding these women, these jobs has on a community in general. So, yeah. So one thing about Zimbabwe is that, especially in the rural areas, it's a patriarchal society um, where men believe that the role for women is in the home and that leadership roles and physically challenging jobs are for men. So gender diversity in mind action has proven to improve the quality of interventions. For instance, in our department, we've got mixed teams for community liaison and 
this has made it easy to establish community dialogue with different affected populations in our communities, especially in a community where a woman cannot address men or actively participate in a male dominated gathering. This also helps to overcome discriminatory ideas about what a woman's role should be and gives us a bigger voice in our communities. So we work towards ensuring that the particular needs of women and girls are recognized and addressed through our community liaison work. Um, I'm reminded of, an, of a popular African proverb that says that if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. So when a woman gets empowered, they, they, they not only develop themselves, but they make it a priority to develop others and empower others. It may be their family, their community, but ultimately they impact a nation. So as, a, as women in a male dominated sector like Mine Action, I believe we are making huge strides towards gender equality and we pose as great role models to other women and girls. And I strongly believe that there's more, there's more to be done as we're still trying to make progress in that regard so that we can change more lives and, and ultimately our nation as a whole. Um, there's a general belief that women are recruited into mine action to, to promote and achieve gender parity and that it's not based on their competency or efficiency. But we as women have proven ourselves to be equally capable of, of, of executing our tasks and duties as our male counterparts if not better, if I may say, because of our ability to, to, to pay so much attention, great attention to detail and the finesse. And we, we do all this with zero preferential treatment from, from our, our counterparts. So that's good. So every morning at 5 a.m., we all start the day with roll call and team briefing, where we go over critical standard operational procedures and safety protocols. We conduct our equipment check and put on our PP before we deploy to our respective tasks until 2 p.m. Um, one thing about MAG is that it offers equal opportunities for both men and women. 26% of our, our MAG staff across our global operations in over 25 countries are highly skilled women who have moved from the sidelines to the front lines, defying all societal norms to rid their communities of explosive ordinances. Um, Mag recognizes that women wear numerous hats and have, and, and I, I can attest that they've given extra support to all our female staff as they balance the demands of their job and those from home. In the Zimbabwe program, for instance, MAG supports female staffs during um, their pregnancies and postpartum with support tailor-made to suit the varied needs of each woman, including three months maternity leave and three months on business accommodation support. So we have um, female staff members who have, who have gone through that process and have benefited from, from that support. So part of my duties also is to conduct gender mainstreaming trainings with staff, stakeholders, and the community. This is meant to facilitate change of mindset and promote a more promote more community buy-in in regards to women playing an active role in manual clearance in multi district. Um, our challenge, the one that prompted us to actually conduct those um, gender mainstreaming sessions with the communities that um, a lot of men in our communities were reluctant to, to have their wives leave home for an extended period of time and work from a field camp base um, with males, with other males. Um, so we continue to mitigate that by sharing our conduct, code of conduct policy in our gender mainstreaming sessions to try and create an enabling environment for women who are interested to to join the mining to come forward. Um, a day in Yamapanda for me can start at 4 a.m. with a call from a desperate woman um, inquiring about the next uh, deminer recruitment. Um, we certainly have to turn them away as we currently, we currently don't have the funding to engage them. Um, this has pushed a lot of women and their families to engage in risky behaviors in a bid to generate income for, to support their families. Um, predominantly, we have people cutting through the minefield to go um, across the border to, to try and do cross-border trading, um, people going into the minefield to cut down trees for charcoal making. Um, 
so when I look at our global goal of being land mine free by 2025, I strongly believe that most, most countries like Zimbabwe with adequate support, financial support and drawing in all, in all our available resources, including both male and females, we can achieve that goal. And try and imagine the, the, the difference that it will make to the lives of these women who are constantly risking their lives to survive. So that would be a good thing. So yeah, so basically that's what I had to say. Um, next, we're going to hear from Emma. Uh, votes have been called in the House, so I'm going to have to excuse myself. But let me just say how um, inspiring all of you are, at showing incredible courage and making the case for how taking on these roles have empowered women in ways that um, we could not have imagined. So I want to say thank you. And uh, Bill, you'll be um, taking it from here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jackie. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to our Q and A now. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have another speaker. I apologize. So let me see. Let's see. That is um, caught myself off guard. I think it's Emma. Correct. Right, yes, Emma. sir. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Yes. Go right ahead, Emma. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Well, um, thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to be here today. And thank you so much to Representative Johnson and Spear for their important leadership on this topic uh, at the Hill. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm particularly honored to be on a panel with such talented and esteemed colleagues. As you've heard from Megan and Delia's experiences, they and the women like them around the world are the real heroes here. Uh, demining is inherently dangerous work. And every day, these women put their lives on the line to make their communities and the world safer. So I just want to thank them personally for all they are doing and the example they are setting to their friends, families, and communities every day. I've been working at the State Department on mine action issues since 2009, working in the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement, or PMWA as we call it for short. My office is responsible for the management and oversight of funding from Congress that goes to organizations like HALO and MAG around the world. I was really fortunate that when I started at PMWRA, I was assigned to work with the only female program manager in the office. At the time, I think there were five program managers and Deb was the only woman. Deb was a firecracker and she hugely impacted my view of women in the workplace and in mine action. She specifically showed me the value in speaking up and asking questions, not just so that your voice could be heard, but because doing so gives others around you permission to do the same. Most meetings that Deb and I would walk into back then, uh, we would be the only women. And as others have noted, I think the mine action sector in particular tends to be very male dominated due to the military backgrounds that many individuals in the sector have. And while these military backgrounds are incredibly valuable when it comes to the technical side of actually removing mines and unexploded ordnance from the ground, they do not always provide operators with the skill set to capture the full needs of a particular community where demining is happening. When we think about women in mine action in my office, we generally think, them, think about them in two important categories, as beneficiaries of the demining work that is being done and as employees of the implementing partners we provide funding to. In both of these categories, it's the unique outlook and experiences women bring to the table that makes them so valuable and essential. In one of the first field visits that I took with PMWA, I visited Afghanistan. I was part of a three-person team from my office and I was the only woman on the team. In Afghanistan, there were cultural norms and rules which made it impossible for my male colleagues to meet and have conversations with the women in the communities we were visiting. As a woman, I was able to sit down with women in the communities and hear about their needs related to the demining work that was being done. When my colleagues and I compared notes at the end of the day, we saw that the men and women we spoke with all highlighted different needs. It became clear to me then that we have a responsibility to ensure that the needs of all community members are heard and factored into the operations we fund, and that it is our job to ensure that projects are structured in a way that allows this ha to happen. It's simply not enough to say we want to hear from women. 
We also have to ensure that our NGO implementing partners are staffed with the right people. This means making sure women are employed on teams so that these necessary and critical conversations with women and communities they are working occur. I've seen a huge amount of progress in this area, both at the State Department and in the mine action sector globally over the past decade. In PMWA, we now have grant requirements built into all projects we fund that focus specifically on gender and age. We require our implementing partners to report separately on the number of men, women, and children beneficiaries under the project, as well as separately report the men and women employed in the program that's funded by the US government. We also require that our implementing partners report whether non-technical and technical survey teams include female employees to ensure that the voices of women and girls are included in survey results so that from the very beginning, projects can be structured to meet the needs of all community members. At a sector level, one example of the progress made globally can be seen at the Geneva Center for International Humanitarian Demining's Gender and Mine Action Program. Knowledge is power, and the Gender and Mine Action Program has a huge amount of useful data for donors and operators on women in mine action. They have a success stories section which profiles women around the world working to make a difference in the field of mine action. Along those same lines, I'm thrilled that in PMWA's upcoming annual report called To Walk the Earth in Safety, there are six articles focusing on women working in mine action across the different geographic regions that we fund. Despite this progress, there are certainly still challenges that we have to overcome. I think the greatest challenge is simply getting over outdated cultural and social norms about women in demining. I remember one visit that I took to the field where I asked a local organization about their employment of women in their organization. And they said, oh yes, we employ women in many positions that they are best suited for. And a red flag went up in my mind and I said, well, well what are those positions that women are best suited for? And they said, oh, we have many women in our office and they do excellent typing due to the fact that they have long and delicate fingers. And I thought, mm, we have a little bit of work left to do here. For every one perspective like that, I can think of 10 other positive examples of women in the field. Team leaders and site supervisors of demining sites I visit regularly say that they love having women on their teams. They note that women help keep the men in line and regularly are their top performers due to their efficiency, attention to detail, and ability to multitask. Having been in the sector for over a decade, I've also had the opportunity to build friendships with women who prove just how successful women in mine action can be. My dear friend Lynn in Vietnam started as an interpreter for a local mine action organization. And now she's a program manager in Vietnam for an international non-governmental organization. She's responsible for over 200 staff members and all UXO operations in the province where she works. Lynn's story is one of many from the sector, and I'm so proud to partner with organizations like Halo and MAG around the world who see value and are committed to including women in all levels of mine action. My experiences have shown me firsthand that without including women in our mine action efforts, our assistance falls short. That's why at the State Department, we are working to fully support the inclusion of women in all mine action efforts that we fund by not only giving them a seat at the table, but by giving them a path to that seat. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions that you all have. Okay, great. Well, hey, thanks all. Uh, these have been uh, these have been great uh, presentations, and I appreciate it. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, folks, put your question in the Q and A uh, part of the uh, of the um, uh, Zoom meeting. You can see that button down at the bottom, and um, and we'll we'll take those in order that they are received. So, right now, I am uh, I'm standing by looking for questions. So far, I don't have any. But ladies, you did a great job. Um, I have one question. Uh, do here, here it is, and and um, you guys can decide uh, who wants to go first. I'll call on each one of you. Uh, the the let me see where did it go? It disappeared. Do demining organizations provide any skills training? 
to women. Um, Emma, why don't you take, why don't you go first? Well, I certainly think that Megan and Delia will be best positioned uh, to answer this question. Uh, but yes, I've certainly seen uh, demining organizations that I've visited around the world who provide uh, skill training beyond just what is in the mine needed for the mine action sector. Though, as as I think others have pointed out on this discussion, the the intense amount of a skills and and high level of professionalism that one needs to be a demining a deminer or work in a demining organization certainly gives you a broad range of transferable skills. Um, but I'll turn it over to Megan and Delia for other specifics. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so HALO does, in addition to the standard demining training that all demining operators receive, um, depending on the program in the country, uh, Angola specifically, um, any type of support training that we can do for the staff, we always try to incorporate. Um, and we do that kind of on two different levels. Uh, we do sort of an internal level where um, a bit more informal, where we can sit down uh, with the staff and ask what it is that are the skills that they would like to learn. Um, oftentimes, a lot of it is computer skills, uh, English language skills, um, and um, sort of hygiene uh, and medical skills. And as far as the medical skills, we have our paramedic demining courses uh, that we offer um, at least once a quarter, if not more. Um, and then we do informal computer courses uh, as often as we can uh, and as often as there's a need for it, as well as the English uh, language classes. That's a lot more informal and mostly just us sitting around trying to talk um, and communicate. On a more formal level, uh, we the Angolan program has been putting forward uh, several proposals to both a local NGO uh, who's been operating in the country for about 20 years now um, that do skill-based trainings. Um, and they we've got a great partnership with them uh, that we wanna continue to try to fund uh, where they will basically come into our demining camps um, and, and teach the skills that the staff would like to learn, um, the women in particular, um, again, along with the language lessons, uh, humanity, um, excuse me, hygiene, um, basic education levels, uh, just general improvement, particularly even with their own language, uh, in addition to English. So we do have several avenues um, that we, like, as I said, both formal and informal um, that we offer for our staff. Delia, I'll let you respond. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess um, we also have the more or less the same approach to staff development. Um, we have an online platform um, as MAG that is open for all staff to undergo any kind of training that they want, be it in program management or um, communication skills and other various um, training packages. And we're also conducting formal trainings on base camp um, on computer um, basic computer and technology models, modules, and we also do have partnerships with other local NGOs that um, we're kind of currently pursuing to try and engage them to come and do some livelihoods trainings with our staff. So I'm, I, it's more or less the same approach, but all of them, um, or as MAG, we don't have currently the capacity to, financial capacity to do something extensive we only try and use the available resources that we have to try and improve our stuff. Okay, well, well thank you. Uh, we had another question that this one's really quick to answer. What can Congress do to best support the efforts of UXO organizations? Um, uh, I, I can tell you, at least from my perspective, having uh, uh, caucus events like this to help people understand the importance of uh, the uh, UXO demining uh, operations around the world and, and the organizations that are involved, but also uh, funding uh, for uh, through the appropriations process to do our part because this, this work doesn't get done for free. I mean, it is painstaking work, it is laborious work, uh, it is, uh, it, it, it requires funding. Uh, do any of you ladies have anything else that you think Congress could do 
uh, that that would be beneficial other than bringing light to the issue and, and funding? If you do, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay. Um, hey, uh, to Emma, uh, a question. How can we help facilitate moving past uh, outdated cultural norms to assist women in the demining sector? Thank you, Representative. Um, I think what I've seen over the past decade is that th the proof is really in the pudding. So the more that we can promote women into leadership positions, you know, starting with deminers moving their way up, um, the exam the examples that they set and the way that they crush these positions as soon as they get into them just proves that, oh wait, this is something that we can do and this works. I think it just takes organizations and donors being willing to take risks and push for women to be included at all levels to then prove to local partners or uh, government officials or other operators that we work with that not only does this work, but it makes things better. Um, so I think, you know, that's certainly something that we at PMWA have thought about. And that's why we've included in all of our grant requirements now that we specifically focus on um, gender and age requirements so that at least from a donor side, we are pushing and saying, hey, these things are important to us. We're going to provide cop top cover to our implementing partners to say, this is something we want you to push on the ground. And we're also willing to have those conversations with our host country counterparts, um, should it be a problem or something that others are not open to. So I think it's really part of a collaborative effort between donors and our implementing partners working together to prove that this works and it's good for everybody. Okay. All right. Um, here's another question. Are women D miners provided the opportunity to take more leadership positions in the D mining sector? Uh, for example, being in the field and being placed in charge of D mining teams. I can certainly speak to Halo for that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's one of our big pushes is uh, from the, the moment we recruit our female deminers, um, we look to see what opportunities. We have a, a pretty clear, both chain of command, but progression level, um, where you go from a, fem uh, from a D miner into a paramedic role, um, into a what we call the section commander, who sort of looks after their team, to supervisor uh, role. And then beyond that, we've got um, even further management um, that gets much, much higher up. And one thing that we really try to work with all of our all of our staff, um, but especially our fem uh, female deminers, is what kind of education they need to be able to progress to these next levels. Um, depending on which country and program it is, the the education level and their background uh, can sometimes be a hindrance. Uh, so we we really focus on what it is that we can do to help um, help these women obtain the skills that they need to then progress uh, within the organization. So that's kind of how HALO works to, to promote um, these opportunities for women. Okay, uh, Delia, I saw that you were you were nodding in agreement. You, you have something to add to this one? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree with Megan. We have the same protocol for, for, for promotions as MAG, but we also are guided by our skills assessment protocol, whereby we um, try and capacitate our, our female deminers based on the skill sets that they are lacking so that they, they, they don't only grow as um, to a level, to a certain level, but they can expand and go through to other portfolios in my action in our departments so yeah okay let's let's continue uh dahlia with you if we could uh and then i'll get each of our uh panelists to answer this one what is the most challenging aspect of your role um the most challenging aspect of my role is um i i am i can't i i'm i am a young lady and a woman. And when I walk into a meeting, it's very difficult to get the same level of respect and attention that other males um, counterparts get. So you have to command that respect and 
and earn that um, that that trust in in your capacity and your capabilities. So you have you are a young lady and you are you are given this huge post and you are in charge of so much in 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 in, in your sector and it's very difficult to try and maneuver sometimes. So the more they get to know you, the more they get to see what you're capable of doing while constantly proving ourselves. So I, I guess that's one of the greatest challenges that we face as women that we are underestimated and then we end up proving them wrong. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Emma? Uh, I think the greatest challenge for me is this, there's never enough money to do everything that one wants to do. Um, you know, the mining sector has so many needs and uh, it's it's challenging to have to say no to certain things when you don't have all the resources. But um, I think we work really creatively with our NGO uh, implementing partners and our, and our colleagues to uh, address the most urgent humanitarian needs that we all identify together. But um, yeah, I think that would be the greatest challenge is not always having the resources to address all of the needs that are out there. There. Megan? I would absolutely agree with Delia on um, trying to command the same amount of respect uh, as, as a young woman uh, in the sector. Oftentimes, as Delia mentioned, you, know, you walk into a meeting and normally my translator or interpreter um, or my support staff are, are men and without fail, they immediately are addressed as as the head of the organization and it's like actually that's that's my role um and to but to be able to have that opportunity to kind of prove that we can do the job just as well um if not better um is it, something that although it's a challenge i think it's one that i absolutely love uh, and am quite grateful that i get that opportunity yeah well, well you guys need to hang out at the johnson house uh, where I've got all of these strong women, uh, you wouldn't have that problem. I have to fight for shower and, and bathroom space uh, in my house. So I'm, I'm the one that's fighting for respect, you know. Um, hey, let's, we got time for one more question. And I think this is an important one because uh, you guys have uh, uh, just listening to you speak and listening to your dedication certainly inspires me. But I want to know what inspires you. Uh, Emma, let's just, or uh, Megan, let's, let's continue with you since you ended the last question. What inspires each of you to do the work that you do in the demining uh, sector? I think that's an easy one. It is the women that I work with. Um, I have had the incredible opportunity to work with some very, very strong women uh, in so many different levels, um, both management above me, um, deminers, um, working their way up and to watch them succeed, I think to me is, is one of the best inspirations that you could possibly find. Um, so yeah, I would have to say the women that I work with. Okay. Delia? Um, as for me, as a Zimbabwean, I'm a national, so being being able to contribute towards effecting change in my country and in my community is what inspires me. Knowing that I had a hand in effecting this change and transforming someone else's life and making it a safer place inspires me every day, so yeah. Good, and Emma. Yeah, I have to agree with both um, Megan and Delia. It's obviously the people are, are number one and, and the women in particular, but I also think that in the mine action sector, we're um, hugely lucky in that the results and of the impact of our work are immediate. As soon as you get rid of a landmine or as soon as you destroy a bomb, that's one item that is no longer going to hurt or injure someone. So the results are immediate and they're really tangible. And so I think that that's something that's really rewarding because that's not always the case in assistance fields, right? Sometimes it takes generations to see change or impact from the work that is being funded. But in Mine Action, we get to see immediate results. And so that's super rewarding. Okay. All right. Well, hey, uh, folks, we've exhausted our time. I've got to run down to the floor and vote also. Uh, so we're going to have to wrap this up. I, I, I want to thank everybody for participating in, in today's important briefing. And I think we can we can see from uh, the, the quality of the presentations from our panelists, uh, we've, we've had a great discussion and, and it's evidence uh, 
uh, obviously that women are making a very, very positive and critical impact on demining operations all around the globe, all around the world. I see that that globe sitting up behind you up there, Emma, and it just uh, it just sort of fits with what we're talking about today because this really is a global issue uh, that that we're dealing with. And uh, I commend all three of you. Uh, you like I said, you certainly have inspired me, uh, and I'm sure you have inspired many. Uh, that are listening to this uh, to this presentation today. So, thanks for uh, for being with us. Thanks for uh, joining, and I look forward to our next UXO Demining Caucus uh, gathering. And um, I'm sure it'll be equally exciting. Everybody, have a good rest of your day, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.